I began growing food in 2009, based on the information I had available. I rummaged through the internet for anything I could find, until I encountered something called permaculture. People were using words like biodiverse, polyculture, food forest, and so on. And then they talked about covering the soil with mulch to suppress weeds, stop compaction, and use less water. Which, though I had never seen before, made sense. That's what a forest does. But then they said it was feeding the soil, which I thought I understood to mean that it was adding nutrients back into the soil. It took me a few years before I began to realize that no, we feed the soil because it's alive. Soil. It's comprised of minerals, organic matter, water, gas, and countless living things. It's said that in a handful of good garden soil, there are more living organisms than people on planet Earth, and more in a small suburban garden than all mammals, birds, and reptiles combined. They include bacteria, fungi, nematodes, and protozoa, along with the tiniest of insects to the very large. There are innumerable different species and complex interactions taking place in this bustling ecosystem under our feet. So much so that new discoveries are being made constantly in this ever-expanding field of study. Someone who has been at the forefront of this expedition into the land of little things is soil microbiologist Dr. Elaine Ingham. None of the soils on this planet are limited in any nutrient required by a plant. So why are you putting on inorganic fertilizers? Why are we putting on out rock phosphate? Why are we putting out what's well, already in your soil in massive quantities. Do we need to be doing that? Because your soil already contains thousands of years worth of phosphorus in order to grow your plants. So why is it when we put a fertilizer out there, we see a plant response? Because what you're missing in your soil are the organisms <coughs> that do that job of making those nutrients available back to your plant. What you're missing is life. Anytime you see a lack of fertility in your plant, the message that should come back to you is, uh-oh, there's something wrong with the life in my soil. None of your soils lack the nutrients to grow plants. None of them. Why does sometimes compost do great things for plant production, and other times it doesn't do much at all, and then other times it actually kills the plant? When you're looking at different soils where plants just won't grow, um, they are just barely eking out in existence, or where the only thing growing here is weeds, you know, just a field of, oh my gosh, weeds, or, you know, cheap grass or something like that, just really horrific. That soil had only bacteria, and it was extremely compacted, possibly even puddling at some time of the year, and you start to finally get a clue that Mother Nature is trying to tell you something here, that when you see these conditions, that that means only the horrible plants or no plants at all are gonna be able to grow. Okay, so now as you start to see fungi coming in, what are the conditions now? We're seeing much better plant growth. Well, and then if we now get protozoa and nematodes and microarthropods and you really have all this community of activity going on, then um, 
you're starting to grow some of the most productive ecosystems in the planet, some of the most diverse. Okay, so how do you add biology? Where do you get all of these organisms? Where do you grow them? Where do you grow the ones that exist in this habitat? So we make compost. Exactly what does it mean, no dig? I came about it a long time ago, 35 years ago. It's worked for me ever since and I've varied the methods a bit, but the essential thing is to disturb the soil as little as possible. In that way, you preserve all the soil life. The organisms which are in the soil are not knocked around, bruised, battered, killed even by cultivations. Instead, they're just left to get on with their work and build a soil structure, aerate and drain. And then and a very important thing you can do as well to help them is to feed them. So that's where mulch has come in, putting organic matter on the surface. What kind of organic matter is depends a bit on your climate. Here in Britain, it's pretty damp mostly. We have a lot of slugs. So I find that compost works the best as a mulch because it does not give habitat to slugs. As far as possible, this whole garden was kept permanent for mulch throughout the year. Mulching not only helps to build up the fertility of the soil and suppress weeds, but it provides ideal conditions for the soil organisms. That is, conditions that are relatively warm and dry in the winter and relatively cool and moist in the summer, which are the conditions which are relished by the living soil organisms, such as earthworms and innumerable microfauna and microfungi, which are the main sources of fertility. Probably the, the biggest thing is the importance of, of uh, capturing the sunlight and having a living plant growing on your soil as much as possible. And then the interactions with the microbes. It's so important for that plant. That plant uh, actually farms the microbes. It sends out hormones to communicate with them and it attracts certain microbes to that plant. These microbes bring in nitrogen, they bring in phosphorus, so they bring in micronutrients, they bring in water, and they actually protect that plant from other uh, harmful microbes. So what we need to do if we wanna increase the diversity in the soil and get rid of some of these predators, or some of these bad, I should say, the bad microbes in the soil, you need to have live plants growing year round, and that really improves the soil. Well, for example, um, every plant We'll have certain, uh, for example, legumes will have uh, um, uh, special bacteria right. that they put in the soil to make uh, nitrogen. Uh, so those that's are, the rhizobia. That's right? the rhizobia. Mm -hmm. And then you have also the uh, mycorrhizal fungus. Yes. And, and the mycorrhizal fungus go out through the soil like a network. Yes. And uh, so a corn plant by itself, Yes. will uh, be able to absorb, uh, explore about 1% of the soil. But when you have these mycorrhizal fungus, they can explore up to 20% of the soil. And they're about one-tenth the size of a, of a hair root. Right. And so they can get into the smaller cracks and crevices to bring back nutrients to that plant. Yeah. When you have mycorrhizal fungus, they form such a network in the soil and they connect yeah. a lot of plants together. There's a, there's a place in Michigan uh, yeah. that they've studied. They have a 30 acre uh, woodland there yeah. and they found one major mycorrhizal that attached to all those trees and it was sharing nutrients between the trees okay. and between the plants. Okay. And so 80% of our plants actually use these mycorrhizal relationships. When you till the soil, it's a little bit like cutting off my arms and my legs. I can't move around very much. Okay. And the other factor is when we over fertilize, yes. then the plant says, I don't need you mycorrhizal. I can get the nutrients on my own. I gotcha, so it and shuts those it down. It shuts them down. Okay. That's wow, exactly that's right. Well, you know, I like to tell farmers that I'm a lazy farmer. And uh, I just like to let the microbes and uh, the earthworms do the work for yes, me. Yes. And if you do that, uh, 
they will actually recycle the nutrients, they will till the soil, and they'll do a lot of the work for them. The only thing you have to do is you have to feed them. Now that we can begin to understand the effects living soil has on plants and the benefits of nurturing the health of soils, there arises another question. How do these plants affect the animals, such as us humans who eat them, as well as the wider macro ecosystems around us? How does food grown in living soil compare to that grown with just nutrient inputs? or in hydroponic systems. So I think if we just look at the difference between soil and dirt, you know, soil is alive. It has life. It has biology. Um, it doesn't just have bacteria. There's fungus. There's all sorts of organisms living in that soil. And then you have also um, a lot of additional things that we don't even know yet with different things that they produce. Um, you know, the, the so um, real soil is, um, it has a biology, it has life. Dirt is pretty much dead. I never knew I'd get into this area, but this is where I'm totally right into right now. And I'm so glad I'm talking to you because it's, uh, it is the missing link to health. Um, it's, it comes from the soil because most of the food in America is grown either hydroponically or aeroponically or even aquaponically. And, yeah. and um, so you don't, it's not the same. And so um, what people don't realize is the, the majority of nutrition in a plant comes from the plant roots eating the microbe with the nutrition, it strips it off, it pulls it in. So we're not just eating plants, we're eating probiotics by a factor of tens of millions of probiotics in your plant. Yeah, I think there's a direct link there between what, again, going back to the soil, uh, where farming has been relying on synthetic fertilizers. So that's in the classic three of the nitrogen, potassium, and the phosphorus which are fed to plants as though, until recently, I think understandings might have moved on a bit, <laughs> but the way I, I came across it in the 80s when I started, so as if plants were gobbling up sort of pure uh, nutrients, one, one of those three, and that was the three that made the big difference in growth. And that ignores the whole biological interaction going on in soil. But it also leads to, as you've already hinted, to hydroponic growing, which really disturbs me because it's very much looking at plants as compositions of, of individual nutrients and completely bypassing that whole biological networking that goes on in soil and helps plants automatically to balance to find what they need for healthy growth. Yeah, yeah, it's trying to create, like even when you put, I think in hydroponic there's a, there's a total of 15 minerals and you're trying to create health from 15 minerals, it's just, it's not enough. It's just, yeah. you, you're creating something from nothing. It's just impossible, you know? So, um, unfortunately, yeah. Oh, I, 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 I tried to grow tomatoes hydroponically through the wind, in my greenhouse during the winter. And uh, I'll tell you, the taste is nothing compared to these out of the garden. It's just completely like, there's nothing there. Just That's nothing. Really it took me a while to figure this out, but the simplicity is that uh, um, you, you, get, you can't get health from things that are, are not alive. Um, and so the more life some food has in it, the, that's where your health comes from. So now we're talking about the soil. How live is that soil? Is it, or is it dead? You, know, you till it, it's, it, now you kill the microbes, and now you're gonna try to, it's kind of like uh, living off with an IV and a little, bag of drips so you're getting a little dextrose and minerals and we yeah. know the complication of that so um yeah yeah all of these cherries are from the same stock same kind of edible cherry and what's really cool is when the cherries are in fruit and i have a tour group i take them through to eat from each of these one, two, three, four, five, six different cherries. And I start them here, and it's really sweet, delicious cherry. And they eat that one. Then I get them to eat this one. And I get them to eat this one, and the next one, all the way to the last one that's up over there. And I say, I want you to taste the flavor of each of those cherries. And some people will say, oh yeah, that's sweet. Oh, that's delicious, delicious, delicious. And I say, at the end, I say, can you taste the difference? And they're like, no. And I said, okay, take one of the cherries from that tree 
and then come down and eat that one and taste the two. And then they notice the difference. And I say that is the difference in the soil where the tree is growing. These cherries are all the same kind of cherry, the same breed, the same kind to eat. But the soil is different. So that's where you get the different flavor. And that's why hydroponic tomatoes taste so bland. Whereas grown in soil, a tomato will have a much bigger, broader flavor of depth and sweetness or tartness or crispness. And it's the soil that makes the difference and it's the soil that makes food healthy. Compost heaps are organic matter in different stages of decomposition. So here we have the current compost heap, that's taken four weeks to fill up at that stage. Uh, everything from the garden, the thermometer there is reading 70 centigrade, that's as hot as you want to go really. You can see it's got a foot long probe on and what's going on here is decomposing the organic matter so that the work of the decomposition has happened before putting on the gun. And then the, the final product is decomposed enough that it's not in soggy lumps which like slugs can live underneath. And slugs in this climate is number one pest. If you're in a dry climate where slugs are not a problem, then maybe you don't need to do this. You could put all this matter just straight on the garden as a sheet mulch rather than needing to make compost. So this is not a given, but I'm explaining that's what we do here. And it's a nice kind of way of dealing with waste and keeping it in a tidy area. And this one we filled in six weeks and finished a month ago. So this is waste mostly from August. And already this one actually is quite decomposed. It's uh, sort of half finished compost or quarter even. And the thermometer there is reading just over 50 centigrade, which is about 120 Fahrenheit. And then going further on, we turn these heaps just once. I find that makes a significant difference after which it's a bit lower of diminishing returns. So, Turning means moving and mixing them up, breaking up the lumps, introducing air, oxygen to feed the bacteria, which means more decomposition. And this heap here was turned actually only one month ago. And at that stage, it was two months old compost. So we're looking here at three months old compost and you can see it's three quarters of the way to being usable. So here we have compost that is now eight months old. It's started life as garden waste early in the year. And I'm just pushing my hand and it's beautifully soft and fluffy. And there it is. So you can see a lot of that is nicely decomposed, broken down, quite friable, quite lumpy. And actually two more things I'll just point out. One is sweet smelling. And that's partly helped by the roof. Now, if you haven't got a roof, and this is in a wet climate, you, you could have you know, a sheet of polythene or anything to keep the rain off, because otherwise it goes a bit soggy. And the color, it's not black, black. It's very dark brown. A small point maybe, but it's, um, it's a good sign of healthy compost. And moisture levels, you can squeeze it and know water comes out. If you get more than two drops of water from compost, it's a bit too soggy and maybe needs a bit of turning and fluffing up. The fragrance of the soil somehow is more tenderness to me than the fancy fragrance of the flower. The strength and sensitivity of life held in the soil lets off waves of passion of a different sort. Passion not of a person, but of my species, that has gone insensitive to all that nurtures it and absorbs it at its end. As I walk barefoot, I break down with passion so profound that it defies all descriptions. O oh, soil, my life.